Okay, so today we have um, Ian is here from from the south of the border. No, you're from America. Virginia Beach. I have to turn on the mic. Did you turn the switch? Uh, okay. Virginia Beach, a USA. Uh, tell us about yourself. Uh, tell us about. You don't need to know about you. You don't have to give up personal information. What we want to know is before the practice, before this course. And after this course, what has changed? Before, uh, I want to say I, I I knew I knew these things, but it was it was only it was only an intellect. I was telling my friends like, oh, you know, you're suffering. This is why you're suffering. This is why we all suffer. But after spending the time here and going step by step, moment by moment, you you you. You get you begin to know exactly why it is, and it's something that you can only know through direct experience. It's words can't really explain. <laughs> Language is insufficient. But, um, How do you feel now? <laughs> What's your feeling today? Been today overwhelmed? Very, very calm. Um, oh. I feel like I can handle a lot more. Mm. Strong. Strong. Invincible, in some might say. <laughs> no, maybe not invincible. You also see um, one of the common things, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but uh, just to ask about it, uh, it's also common to have a better picture of what you have yes, yet to the work you have yet to do. Definitely. Uh, it's been said before, but uh, the iceberg, you know, what I, mm. what I thought I had to do was okay. just the tip, and <laughs> there's a lot more, I see more work to be done. You know, today I was getting my ticket, and I was, you know, having to get my password, and I was getting frustrated with that. I was like, mm. oh my goodness, it's <laughs> still here. Still, um, still things that need to be uprooted and understood. Okay, well, thank you, Ian. And Ian's actually already uh, going to do the second course, no? Expert camera skills. This is uh, all right. Ian's uh, sticking around, already asking about the instructor course, so we may actually have a candidate, first candidate here in Canada. I haven't taught an instructor course in meditation in a long time. The idea of being an instructor is, uh, well, talk, talk about that some other time. I mean, it's, it's not like you suddenly become a teacher, but you learn the, the technical skills necessary to lead someone through basic practice. Anyway, tonight I wanted to talk about, about this, the benefits of the practice. More specifically, why we practice. And it's a bit of a trick question, actually. I'm not actually... I want to distinguish between benefits and reasons. Maybe not even reasons, it's not quite the right word. And because we have this problem. You know, Buddhism is about freeing ourselves from desire, and yet... Isn't that a desire? Right? I mean, to some extent, it's the problem with semantics. But to some extent, it's, it's really not. It really is an apt question. Isn't the desire to be free from desire also a desire? I would say, yes, it is. And therefore, it's problematic, right? So we have this dilemma. 
And we can talk about the benefits of the practice. There's lots of them. And they're great. They're great for encouraging meditators. That's what they're good for. So we have the five reasons why the Buddha taught Satipatthana, what he said, what does Satipatthana, what does the practice of Sati, of mindfulness, what does it lead to? It leads to your leads to purity. Your mind becomes more pure. Satanang visuddhya, visuddhya, satanang visuddhya. It allows you to go beyond mental illness, sorrow, lamentation, despair, depression, anxiety, all these problems that we have. It helps you overcome suffering, physical suffering and mental suffering. And it leads you to the right path, it leads you to the goal, to freedom, to Nibbāna. So we have all of these, these are great reasons to practice. Who wouldn't want a pure mind, right? Who wouldn't want to be able to say that their mind is pure? You don't hear people saying, oh, I'm so glad I'm such a corrupt individual. I don't know, maybe such people do exist. I don't meet such people. I'm blessed to meet mostly people who are very much interested in a pure mind. And so on, being free from suffering sounds great. But the problem is when you when you cling to it, when you when you even strive for it, you get stuck because you're clinging, and clinging is the cause of suffering. You're craving; craving is the cause of suffering. Ajahn Tong always talks about four benefits. These are good four things to tell those of you who have finished the course. So listen up, Ian. This is for you. There are four things that you get from the practice from doing, let's say, the foundation course, or a foundation course in insight meditation. Uh, the first is mindfulness. Mindfulness is actually a goal. It's a great, wonderful outcome. This is what I meant by invincible. No, you're not invincible, but um, when you're mindful, that mind state is an invincible mind state. It's an it's a, a incredibly powerful tool. Because suddenly there's no you, there's no, there's nothing to be hurt. <laughs> you know, there's no problem. Problems disappear. There's only events. There's only experiences. You know, if I were giving a talk in real life, we wouldn't we wouldn't allow for all this chatter. Sri Lanka, in Sri Lanka, they're really all about asking questions during the Dhamma talk. But save the chatter for after, please. I don't mind, but it's got to be distracting for the audience. It's right on Second Life, they're chattering. And it's all wholesome. But let's save the talk for afterwards. There's a time, Kalena Dhamma Savanang. There's a time to listen to the Dhamma. Kalena Dhamma Sagacha. There's a time to talk about, discuss the Dhamma discussion after. So sati, mindfulness, is the first benefit. It's actually a benefit of the practice. Why? Because you have this wonderful tool. You can practice it throughout your life. You know, any problems that come up, you can find challenges, conflicts, anything, work, study, relationships, physical suffering, mental suffering, loss. Mindfulness is this wonderful tool that you get. Walking down the street, what do you do? Walking, walking. You have this tool that's applicable everywhere. Brushing your teeth is brushing, brushing. The second one, in sort of a corollary, is uh, happiness. Right? As a result of being mindful, you find happiness. Ajahn Tong talks about this as heaven, going to heaven. But that's just the that's just one form of happiness. Heaven is, of course, a great happiness. But it's more general than that. There are so many happinesses that come from, from letting go, from being free, from seeing clearly, from a pure mind. 
the third is is um, they say upanisaya, which means you plant a seed. Upanisaya is um, it means different things in Thai. They, in Thai, Thai they they talk about it as being what you bring into your into your next life, what you carry on with you. So uh, I describe this as a start. So the third benefit is you get a start on the path. You're no longer a beginner meditator. You're no longer a neophyte. You're no longer a uh, you're no longer a luddite. Uh, that's a muggle. Isn't this word muggle? Muggle. I don't know. There's this Harry Potter is this big thing, right? And, Mu is it muggle? Is that the word? No magic muggle is the right word, isn't it? <laughs> Muggles are, I'm told, they're non-magic folk. That's what a muggle is. And then there's the whatever the opposite of muggle is, I don't know. You're no longer one of those. You're no longer in the out crowd. And it's not about belonging to a crowd, it's about having something wonderful. You, know, you can go and and practice on your own. You can continue on, find other meditation groups. You are now a, a veteran, a graduate. You've got to start. And you take that with you. The point of Upanisaya, Upanisaya is you take it with you into your next life. Everything here you forget, people, places, and so on. But mindfulness is different. It changes it changes your core, it changes who you are. It's a very deep seated change to the to very basic habits of our of our being. You know. So it changes the whole trajectory of our journey in samsara. And the fourth is a finish. Now it's possible through the basic course that you become a sotapanna, this is always possible. It's possible that you, through many years of practice, you become a sotapanna, a sakadagami, anagami, arahant, it's all there, it's all possible. It's just a question of your effort and your merit and perfections, your goodness and your perfections. How much goodness you have, how much stored up um, purity you already have just waiting to be used, put to use and actualized in the meditation practice. You could become enlightened through this practice. So, four very good reasons to practice. But again, the problem, you know, what if you sit there saying, am I a Sotapanna yet? How do I become a Sotapanna? When am I going to become a Sotapanna? I want so much to become a Sotapanna. That's very, that's a bad idea. As our meditators know, when they get to the end of the course, we have them make these resolves, and man, that can be such a, the resolve, the resolution can be such a, uh, such a hindrance to the practice because you're waiting for it to happen, expecting for something special to happen. And that destroys your practice. And and so it's more than just a, a quandary. It speaks to the very nature of samsara, which is the nat versus the nature of nibbana. This is where this problem comes from. Samsara is cause and effect. You know, everything, every part of this universe that we know it, that we know, is conditionally formed, sankhara, sankhata. Everything that is conditioned, everything that is cause and effect, is samsara. Nibbana is unconditioned. You can't bring about Nibbana. You can't cause it, evoke it, cause it to arise. It, it doesn't arise. There is no arising of Nibbana. 
it is permanent. No, permanence may be the wrong word, but it is stable. It is stable and it is satisfying. It is eternal, undying, unchanging. If it's unchanging, how could you cause it to come, cause it to arise? So because Nibbana is not cause and effect, you know, the way we approach it and the way we, we, we you know, the way we approach, the way we gradually work to, uh, to bring ourselves closer to this, to freedom, has to be quite different. It can't be cause and effect. You can't be working towards some goal. Working towards goals, that's samsara. This is why this emphasis on the present moment, it's a very good reason why we have to focus on the present moment, because we can't be about cause and effect. We can't be striving for some goal. Even though we often use those words, when you practice it can't be about that. It has to be putting down the burden, giving up, giving up our ambitions. So when we look to our practice, we have to be much more about the, the, the quality of the practice, the purity, the goodness, rather than the happiness, the peace. All of the benefits that we talk about, even listening to meditators describe the, uh, the, 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 the outcome of the practice, it's great encouragement and reassurance to remove your doubts. Yes, this is a good path, but it won't help you in the practice. You can't think, am I there yet? Okay, what do I have to do to become like that person? It's not how it works. And you get so caught up, hung up, held up, held back, when you try to look for results. Yeah. Am I getting anything out of this practice? It's a futile. It's, it's not that you couldn't see, it's that it wouldn't be useful if you did. When you're doing that, you're no longer meditating. So be about quality. Quality in the present moment. It's like put your nose to the grindstone, don't ever look up. Do your work, your bank account fills up by itself. The Dhamma checks are, are what do you call, auto-deposit? What's the word? You get, you get paid automatically. No need to receive a check. Your bank account, your, your dharma bank fills up by itself. You just do the work. Direct deposit, yeah, that's it. All right. So, a little bit of talk about benefits nonetheless. It's always good to talk about because it's a reassurance, but a reminder and a warning that this is not how we should approach our practice. Practice should always be about the practice itself. Why we practice? Why we practice is because not practicing is a cause of suffering. Why we practice is because we have ignorance. Why we practice is because there's a problem. Why we practice is it's very much about the rightness and the propriety of it, the goodness of it, rather than we do it for X goal. We can't, we can't always be thinking about this. We have to give up the idea of motivation, of being motivated. Our motivation, if, if we use the word, should be for purity, for quality, for rightness, goodness, here and now and let the results come. It's like this whole God thing, right? People say you have to do X or else God will be angry at you. If you do X, God will be pleased. I just think, you know, if God's going to be angry at me, isn't that His problem? If God's going to be happy for me, is that really, you know, am I really, is this really a carrot and the stick sort of thing? What an awful way to live. Just another reason to never believe in any God. There. And with that, I think we've covered just about everything. 
That's the Dhamma for tonight. Thank you all for tuning in. Have a good night.